I'll just make this very special requirement to the afternoon hmm. speakers to please be uh, on schedule, and I'm sure there'll be no uh, question about this with Giacomo, who will yes. be <laughs> staying in his 30 minutes with no effort. So it's a big pleasure for me to have Giacomo, uh, who will speak about evaluate, evaluation and pricing of risk and the stochastic volatility. Please, Giacomo. Okay, uh, Eichel, thank you so much for this opportunity. Eichel pushed me a lot. Uh, Again, another reluctant another, speaker, I'm, I should have I'm said. I'm the second in a row. <laughs> He was pushing us because, uh, as uh, you will see, indeed I'm not working on game and decisions theory. And the work I'm going to present here today is basically done in collaboration with two guys sitting here and working here at the Escola, Fulvio Corsi and Adam Majewski. And uh, it's basically an econometric approach to time series. But uh, when I had asked me to prepare this uh, talk, I tried to uh, draw a connection with the uh, decision theoretic framework. So here is the agenda, and it's divided in three parts, and uh, it's a kind of uh, very short tutorial, because uh, original results are in the last part. You see here these realizing smiles and quantiles. Um, I'm not going to talk about these results in a technical way. I want just to give you a flavor of what we are doing. If you're interested in, we can discuss it later. And uh, the only thing that I assume, because the audience is quite heterogeneous, is that uh, everyone knows what is an option, basically. And so the first part will be devoted and freely inspired by this paper you can find on the web by Attilio Meucci. What is the relation between P and Q measures? Risk natural measures, Q, and P, uh, objective measures. A brief overview of two big branches of quantitative finance. The second part is the bridge between what I've been working on for many years and uh, how can we price options by means of stochastic discount factors. And I will show you in the last slide how can we use it even to compute quantiles under the P word. So, uh, what is the main topic when we, we deal with the P word? Well, it's risk and portfolio management, which is uh, basically, the aim is modeling probability distribution once you observe time series, financial time series especially, I'm interested in, and you want to, you assume a data generating process, you want to estimate it on the data, and you want to extrapolate, you want to characterize the behavior or the underlying quantities on a future horizons. So the main task re uh, regards uh, how to build a model for past dynamics of prices, which are monitored on a discrete time basis, and are stored in a form of time series. And so the main goal is estimate the parameters. Uh, this is... Uh, sequence of cartoons. I won't just give you the flavor, what is going on. This is the famous legacy of Basel II, which is the infamous value at risk requirements, marginal requirements. And so the idea, I, I try to be optimistic. I put losses on the right side. And uh, so you, you have a time series. You want to characterize the probability density associated with this time series. And value at risk is basically this quantile here. You fix a significance, 5%, and you want to know what is the worst loss you can incur if 95 times over 100 you experience this distribution. You can rephrase it in terms of cumulative density function. And in this case, uh, you are going to try to characterize this region here. But as you probably know, this measure suffers many drawbacks. One is the famous lacking of coherence, which means if you differentiate your portfolio, it's not taken for granted that your bar measure is decreasing. And so it would be better to work with the barycenter of the distribution, which is the average loss you incur if you go above the threshold. But let's go back to the, this cartoon here. And you see here, it appears this figure. And I want to characterize exactly this curve here. And this curve, is uh, 
the scaling of the quantiles that you observe empirically. These uh, red triangles represent the empirical quantiles that you can obtain very easily. You order your time series and you weight each point with one over capital T. Capital T is the length of the time series. This is something which is model independent. You just order and wait. Then, if you want to characterize it in terms of a data generated process, you can start with a Brownian motion. And if you do this in a very naive way, you obtain this one, this curve here, with a maximum likelihood approach. So there is something which is not working very well. So you need to add something. Why? Because real data look like this. This is the time series from the standard report. And you see that the amplitude of the oscillations is not constant. It's a persistent process. You have periods with low volatility and periods with high volatility. So this is the reason why uh, in the literature that has been introduced this concept of stochastic volatility. And if you do this, and you model this, for example, in continuous time, for example, the Eston model, you can obtain this curve here, this one, which is a very good description of the data. This is on a daily horizon. This curve here are the expected shortfall, which is a different measure of the risk. And the linearity between value at risk and expected shortfall is a consequence of the stream value theory. But an important consideration is that look at the scales. We are considering up to 10% quantiles. And on a daily horizon between uh, the typical value here, you can see the here there should be a, a line. The 1% level of uh, value at risk on a daily horizon is 3.62%. But then the regulators require you to project this quantity on a 10 days horizon. So if you want to project, you need a model. And you see the data becomes more sparse and the Brownian motion is catching up because of the central limit theorem, and the Eston model performs quite well. So this is one of the typical tasks you have to deal with if you want to work in a P world, the, the real world. But what about the Q world? The Q world is the risk neutral world. What is this world? Is there a world that, who knows if it really exists, but gives different ways to the same events that you experience in the real world. And the main difference between the P and the Q world is the risk premium. So you want to characterize Q, and you want to calibrate Q and the probability Q on the uh, financial assets, options, and derivatives that are traded on the market. And what is really important is that the Q world is a forward-looking world. You are guessing what will be the future state of the world, where future means uh, synchronized with the expiry of your, for example, option. And see, uh, is it possible to compare the Q and the P world? Yes, you can do that. You can do that, and there is very beautiful paper which just appeared on Journal of Financial Economics, which is very related with behavioral assumptions, because you see here, these are volatility, skewness, and kurtosis, which mean the second, third, and fourth moment that you can obtain if you measure them in the real world and if you extract them from the Q world. So you see here that, uh, well, obtaining this picture is far from being trivial. It's extremely complicated because you want to characterize the data, project, data generating process in terms of an Higarch process. You are working with a surface with out of the money options, and uh, you want to extract these implied moments in a non-parametric way. So it's, it's quite technical, but you can see here that the volatility is quite well described, it's quite well captured, yes? Uh, so just a curious, so just to understand better, so you have, um, so two lines means like one, phys one is the physical and the other is the risk neutral moment. Yes, the, the dark one is physical and the white and one. And all this complicated procedure you were mentioning is to estimate the, the physical ones. 
physical one and also the uh, Q ones. The and the Q ones, do, do they use the Briden Nitzenberger formula to extract them from the price of options? Or? Yes, a kind of derivation of that. Okay, kind of a derivation. Yes, yes, that. not exactly that one. You have to ex ah. you have to extract the implied density and characterize the moments, but it's basically that one. Yes, and you see that. Uh, uh, the, risk, the physical world, for example, look at the kurtosis. The kurtosis is measure the deviation for the normality. It's the weight of the tail events. And you see that agents placing orders in an option market seems to be more conscious about the extreme risk that you can face. Indeed, quite, it is quite evident that in many periods of time, the risk-neutral implied kurtosis is higher than the risk neutral one. And you can see also the, the skewness. The skewness is bigger in absolute values. Is there a way to make these two uh, words, very different words, to speak one with the other one? Uh, so this is what I'm really not an expert on. What, this is what I've been studying because I, I wanted to uh, have some common language to discuss with you. And so probably all of you is much more uh, prepared than me about this, uh, um, this problem, which is basically a problem of optimization of a consumption investment problem. And uh, in a problem where an agent is, wants to maximize an intertemporal utility. And so uh, the optimal condition that I'm going to derive uh, reveal the existence of a universal random variables, which is the stochastic discount factor, which allows you to price contingent claims in a consistent way. So how the, the, the thing work? Well, uh, I have to thank the first speaker of the day, uh, Simone, if I'm not wrong, because this is basically one slide for what he presented us in his beautiful talk. And so, I can basically skip uh, uh, these two lines here, which are related with the introduction of uh, expected utility representation. I'm going to assume very basic axioms, the one, for example, assumed by von Neumann and Morgesen. And what, I'm, what I would like to work with is a consumption plan, two periods consumption plan. And seems I'm assuming that I'm in this framework there exists this utility, two period utility function. So what is the problem? And I'm going to assume also this uh, um, structure for the two period utility function, which in many asset pricing application is not, uh, it's not unrealistic, but it, it can be. It can be even undesirable because of the relation with relative risk aversion and many other uh, parameters. But what is important, just to give an intuition, the structure is linear, and the felicity function in the future is discounted today by means of a discounting factor, constant. I assume it's constant, beta, between 0 and 1. And so the problem is that the investor has this wealth, Wt, at current time t, and he has to decide how to allocate. He can consume Ct, or he can invest in capital held different assets it can find in the market. And so this is a budget constraint. Then at the end of the period, T plus one, all the asset pays a stochastic payoff. And uh, the final constraint is that the final value of the portfolio should be consumed. And when you frame this in a optimization problem, you are going to maximize over C, over the consumption bundle, and over the weights of your portfolio, the expected utility with these constraints. Then simple algebra, you obtain this formula here. This is the very fundamental formula I'm going to use. This is a consistency relation between the current price, P, and the future unknown payoff. And you see here that this quantity, which is the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution, which is basically the ratio between marginal utilities discounted, is what you need if you want to bring your 
random knowledge in the future today. And uh, for example, you can grasp from some intuition about this problem because if the agent knows that the future consumption is going to be low, is he wants to buy assets today, and because of the excess demand, the price is going high. So P today should be high. And indeed, if C T plus one is low because of the concavity of the monotonicity, this ratio here is going to be greater than one. So this is consistent. You are discounting with a factor which is greater than one. But now I want to abstract from this context, and I want just to assume that there exists this strictly positive random variable, mt t plus one, which, is, which has to satisfy this kind of constraint, consistent relation, consistency relation. And uh, there is this very fundamental results in ascent pricing theorem that can be rephrased in many different languages, uh, existence of equivalence, risk neutral measures, uh, many different arguments. But uh, what is the economic content of this uh, stochastic discount factor? The economic context is the following one. If the market is free of arbitrage, there, there, there is at least one stochastic discount factor that is uh, a strictly positive random variables which satisfies the consistency relation I showed you before. What is the absence of arbitrage? Well, uh, for those of you who are here in Pisa, you, you know that on a fortnight basis, we usually organize this no free lunch seminar where you indeed can have lunch for free, but uh, so absence of arbitrage, arbitrage means basically that if there is a contingent claim that is a payoff, which is going to pay you in the future a random quantity, and the set of values where the outcome is positive as a strictly positive probability, you can pay for that claim today a negative price. Otherwise, you will enter this contract someone is going to pay you, and at the end, you will receive, on average, a positive quantity. It's a free lunch. And the second economic content is that if the market is complete, this stochastic discount factor is unique. Well, completeness, I'm going to show it in a, in a few minutes, an example, is something where very theoretical, because discrete time models are not complete. Stochastic volatility markets are not complete. So it's, it's really a theoretical uh, concept. But this result is very general. And so the point is that how can you use this kind of result? For example, consider the discrete time Black Scholes model. I have basically an economy with three uh, instruments a risk free zero coupon bond, which pays one in the future. I have a risky assets, and the risky asset X is expressed in terms of Y, log returns, which I'm going to assume normal, distributed. And I also have the, the option payoff. Well, with this free function, I can't basically reconstruct every square integrable random variables. So the linear space I can reconstruct with my traded instruments can describe the entire space of payoffs. This is what is meant by incompleteness of the markets. And now, how can I price this instrument? I can resort to this absolute pricing approach, which is preference-based set. Uh, I can assume, for example, that consumption grow is log normal. I can assume that the power, the utility is a power function, time separable, and in this framework, you can exactly obtain the black shell result. But what I wanted to use, because it's what we have used in the future slides, is the relative pricing approach. I can forget about this preference-based setting, totally forget about it, and just assume an affine function. Well, what is an affine function? It's 
already clear from the first lecture of the day. And I take the exponential. So this is for sure positive, non-negative defined. And I'm going to impose the consistency relation, the non-arbitrage condition. So for the bond, which is paying for sure one at the end, I'm discounting with the stochastic discount factor, I impose that this expectation is equal to one. It's equal to one if r is equal to zero, exponential of minus r. And uh, I'm going to do the same with the uh, risky assets. If you do this, you can fix univocally new zero and new one, and you solve the problem. Now, our <coughs> contribution, which is indeed uh, a way to deal with P and Q by means of stochastic discount factors. This is the work we are, I'm doing with Adam and Fulvio. And the first part is related to the characterization of a data generating process. This is the, more, the most technical slide of the, the talk, and which I'm going to uh, describe quite carefully. So I'm assuming that the returns are the product of a Brownian motion, basically, times the stochastic volatility. So basically, the returns are conditionally normal. And RV is the variance. And this is the typical drift that you have, the risk-free plus the risk premium, which depends on the heat of correction here. Then there is this hierarchical structure. You are going to sample RV from a gamma distribution, non-central gamma distribution. This C here is the rate or scale we are still to understand better, uh, parameters. Delta is the shape, and this is the non-centrality parameters. What does that mean? And this is the structure of the non-centrality parameters. This means that when you are going to sample RBT plus one, you are going to center gamma on this quantity here. This quantity here is a superposition of the past 22 RV, which we clustered in three groups, the daily basis, the weekly basis, and the monthly basis. This is quite similar to an R22 process, but since we are basically weighting the weekly and monthly with the same weight, this is an heterogeneous autoregressive model. And then we have here the leverage, which is the effect of past returns on the current level of RV. And this is the quantity we are working on very hard, because we want to find a way to describe the leverage in a realistic way and also analytically tractable way. And I think we succeeded with this. In probably in two months, we will <laughs> deliver the, the preprint. So indeed, this model is taken from the very nice paper by Fulvio and co-authors, which appeared on Journal of Financial Economics very recently. And what is RV? RV is a proxy of the variance. But it is not an hidden object. It's realized variance. That is the sum of the squared increments on a daily basis. So you can really measure it. It's a measurable quantity with respect to your information set. This is the typical, uh, it's not so, well, the bold line is the prediction. There should, be, uh, there should be a dotted line here. It's not so easy to see it. OK. But this is the typical uh, behavior of the realized variance. This is taken from standard pool 500. And you can see that if you have been working with an autoregressive process of order three, which is a very short memory process, well, the forecast of your model will be very bad. But you can work with two kinds of models. One, which is the fractionally integrated model, autoregressive with a moving average component. This induces persistence, and you can get a very well description of the data. But you can get it even with a much more simpler conceptually model, which is the R model which is the heterogeneous autoregressive model, where you are plugging in the typical time scales of the human behavior, daily, weekly, and monthly. <clears throat> if you do this, you see that the forecast is very good. 
So now, what is our contribution? We studied what is the shape of the stochastic disband factor we need if you want to price options within this framework, which is a time discrete framework, which are likely very much, much more than continuous time, to be honest. And why is this so powerful? Because of this relation here, which is a very strong relation. We put together Q and P words. Every time you want to compute the expectation with respect to Q, that is neutral word, you can do that in the P word, in the real, in the real world, just discounting with your stochastic discount factor. And so, can we, uh, can we assume a very specific form for this stochastic discount factor which ensures positivity? Yes, this is for sure. And, Sorry. yes, absolutely. I don't know much of, of this literature, but I mean, the idea seems like magic, right? The in general, the stochastic discount factor idea, you can replicate it on the market, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But uh, how, I mean, how can you post, I mean, with, with what reliance, uh, subjective reliance, can you postulate the form of the distribution of the stochastic discount factor? Well, this is a relative pricing approach, so I'm just guessing the shape. I want uh, random quantities which is positive definite, and I want that all the uh, consistent relation hold. That's what I want. Nothing more than this. It's sufficient for me. Okay. If you want, you can go on and you, you can add some structure. If you have some utility, I guess for the utility, you can try to derive this, but we didn't do this. I, I, as I said at the beginning, we treat this problem from an econometric point of view. I tried to, to bridge with your language, but... About the presentation, and, I mean, and this idea of stochastic discount factor is a very beautiful idea in finance, but uh, I mean, I all, my, my, my guess as a reader uh -huh. is, but how the heck can I find it? I mean, this is the... Yes, as a technician, I would say, yes, try this because it's sensible, because it's... It's positive definite. If you take the expectation with respect to, to P, well, this is going to be one, which means it is consistent with all the risk, zero risk coupon, um, zero coupon bonds. And then you have to, to impose also the, the constraint if you want to price uh, risky assets. And this is what you had done with Fulvio and with Adam. And you can basically have to find if there is any constraints between new one and new two. And I'm going to comment on this, but do you have any question? Yeah, uh, just a curiosity, because I was looking at the stochastic discount factor that you wrote. It's partially connected to Fabio's question, because it's reminiscent uh, of um, some form, because the stochastic discount factor mathematically is a derivative of Radon Nicodem. So it's somehow, uh, reminiscent uh, of a formulation that you get via the relative entropy, the one that uh, you specify up there. So I was wondering if by any chance you were using the preferences of Hansen and Sargent in, in the problem that you, were, you, you described before, because they are expressed with the utility that is the negative exponential, and then the form, you know, somehow reminiscent. So, but again, it's just an optical illusion. I was just curious to know. Uh, I think this was for a suggestion to try to understand this because I, I can't answer. I don't know. Okay. And uh, once, you, once you impose the constraint, the consistency constraint, you discover that new two, which is this constant in front of the logarithm of uh, the log return, is exactly related with the equity risk premium. And uh, what is the role of new one, which is the quantity which is multiplying the realized variance? Well, it is not trivially related only with the volatility risk premium, because, and as you can, as you can understand from uh, the Ito correction, when you correct, when you move them from the arithmetic to geometric Brownian motion, the variance is entering both the Brownian motion and the drift. So. This quantity here is related to risk, equity, and volatility risk. But once you do this, and when you impose the constraint, you can solve it, 
there are some, there is one frame parameters, new one, that you can calibrate on your volatility surfaces. And this is the result of the tracking of the implied volatility on this, uh, these are, if I'm not wrong, volatility on standard poor options. And you see that you can track very well the implied volatility of the shortest maturity at the money option available in our data set. And the HARG model is tracking very well this behavior. And now let me conclude with the last two slides. I'm in time. And which is the application I, I like very much, uh, which is an application of a kind of stochastic discount factor in the P world. Because remember, we started with the, from, from the characterization of the value at risk, which is a task you have to deal with in the real world. And uh, everything I've been working on is related with the real measure. Not real in the sense real world, but real, the field of reals. But what can we gain if we move to the imaginary plane? And I always love this sentence from young Torles Musil, no? when he was unable to sleep because he was always thinking about the square root of minus one. And indeed, he said, well, we are used to work with the real quantities, weights, lengths. But if you work with imaginary quantities, you can have a ride in this imaginary plane. You start from the real line. You end up on the real line. You have this ride on the imaginary plane, and you are su successful. And so it's like a bridge where the piles are there only at the beginning and the end. And you have this ride on the imaginary plane. Why is this so interesting, at least for me? Because you can characterize value at risk lambda star and its relation with p star, the significance level, if you compute this integral, what is this guy here? Is the stochastic discount factor, okay, yt. This was new one, but now it's complex. It's no more real. It's exactly this guy here. I don't have the new one. And if you have this ride on the imaginary plane, and you take the computation on this branch, in, on this path here, you get exactly the relation between p star and lambda star. So, that's the end. Thanks very much, Giacomo. We have one minute for maybe 30 seconds for a question. This is a very short question. Is there a very super quick question? No? That was quick. Thanks again. <laughs>